very much. Well, it's Ash Wednesday, the day when devout Catholics will make their way to church to have a tiny black suit mark made in their foreheads by a priest. It's also the day in 1945 when a wave of American bombers swept over the Baroque city of Dresden to finish up the carnage begun by Bomber Command the night before. Historians have set the death toll at up to 25,000 in a city of three quarters of a million. AJP Taylor observed that the politicians, led by Churchill, rounded on Sir Arthur Bomber Harris as sole architect of what the War Cabinet, who'd all signed off on it, referred to as thunderclap against the people of Dresden with its rich cultural heritage and relative lack of industrial or military targets. Our job tonight is to go back, with due warning, to these hellish Dresden days with a British man who lived through them. Vic Gregg is 93 now, and with the help of the writer and director Rick Stroud, has written a factual memoir of the raids for the only reason, he says, of horrifying people so much that they never again allow their representatives to order such crimes. By the time he got to Dresden as a POW, Vic, who had been a British infantryman in some of the toughest corners of the war and had just survived the Battle of Arnhem, must have thought he'd seen it all. You're quite right. This is the attitude that uh, I think we all had. Uh, those of us who uh, come out of Arnhem, especially the lads who I was with, uh, who had uh, volunteered for the paratroops from the 7th Armoured Divin, uh, just before uh, we went into Italy, you could say we had seen it all because we was in the uh, we was in the war right from the start. We thought we were indestructible. Arnhem must have been just awful for you. I mean, Arnhem well, it was a terrible battle. Yeah, but it, Arnhem was just, to to me. It, Arnhem was another battle. It, it took longer. It was six days, yes, but it was just another battle to me. These battles what we had have got worse and worse as the years went by. As you were a prisoner. Did you think, well, that's it, that's the end of my war now? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. What did they actually put you to? What, what, was, the, what was the first thing that happened to you when you were taken prisoner? It wasn't too bad. I was taken prisoner. They, they caught... I, because I was on a, on a perimeter with a machine gun, and so we were left there to cover the lads who were crossing the river and getting away. And uh, we got away, and two days after they crossed the river... They captured us, a group of us, half a dozen of us. And they they just said, come on, Tommy, that's it. The war's over for you. Krieg is fertile, that sort of thing, you know. We sh- got you- shifted to a transit camp, which was a bit naughty. But on the whole, no, they were, I, I had never had any complaints about my treatment as a German prisoner of war. But what did you, how did you end up in Dresden? What did you do? Uh, well, uh, I was in 4B, which was a big camp with thousands of blokes who had been captured since Dunkirk and I wanted to get away and there's no way of getting away out of them places so uh, a group of us volunteered for a work camp and they sent us down to uh, Nieder Sedlitz which was uh, about six kilometres from the centre of Dresden to the south of it, Nieder Sedlitz and uh, we still got away, tried to get away they kept on capturing us and in the end the chap in charge of the camp uh, put us on this uh, soap factory which entailed a walk of about six kilometres every morning and every night coming back with the snow about two foot deep which he considered not the work but the walk was the punishment as it was and he gave us a pair of wooden clogs to do the walking and uh, I'd done something stupid which caused the factory to burn down so I ended up in this strafflager in the centre of Dresden, uh, waiting to be shot for sabotage with the lad I was working with who come from Yorkshire. This guy called Harry, Harry right? Yeah. Hi. Harry got killed when the when the bomb landed outside the outside this uh, building and uh, blew the building in and Harry got killed with a blast. Had everything knocked out of his insides. And I got away with it. When the, when the air raid started, what was it like? How did you know that an air raid Well, it started? had a glass roof. It had a, a sort of a cupola, which was glass, this building. And you could, first of all, you'd get the uh, air raid warnings, and everybody doesn't take, nobody takes any notice of that, because they've been getting air raid warnings every night. 
and they just think it's uh, Chemnitz or Leipzig or somewhere like that until uh, these pathfinders came over and dropped the flares. Then about five minutes after that, when the flares are going well, uh, the first wave appear. First wave of, uh, I think it was about 600 or something, I think. And they, they, go, over the, uh, they go over the city in, in, in rows. So it takes, about, it takes about half hour for them to all go over. And they're dropping uh, thousands of these stick incendiaries and thousand pound bombs, five hundred pound bombs and stuff like that in the first raid. And uh, that's when they, uh, that's when uh, the first bombs landed in, come through the glass roof and killed and killed all these blokes who were underneath it. it your them. friend, your friend Harry. No, we was we, the guy who said he said let's go to the wall, didn't he? he said, yeah, we, he we, said to you let's get away from that. Yeah, yeah, we it, we had these two Americans with us who we'd met in there, and we all decided that uh, we wasn't going to. When we heard the air raid warnings, we thought, well, you know, we looked up in the sky and thought we didn't really realise that it was going to be bombed at the time, but it was just sort of an instinct to get in a corner somewhere, which we did. But unfortunately, when the when the blockbuster come down and knocked all the building in, uh, it threw me over the other side of the room, and I got buried in all the rubble. And Harry, he took the full blast of the uh, concussion sort of thing. And it knocked everything out of his... Uh, he didn't have anything inside him, apparently. From what I could see, there was blood out of his ears and out of his nose and stuff like that. And I covered him up the best I could with his overcoat and uh, I got out of the building before it all fell down on top of me and uh, there was about 20 of us outside what well, out of about 300 who survived and we was out in the street then but you didn't know it was a street because uh, it's just in the middle of a big bonfire After the first raid was finished the, the sirens start all over again and wh what was different then about that second Raid. Well, the second raid was entirely different than the first raid. The second raid, the uh, the incendiaries they sent down were much bigger. You could see them coming down. They were so big, they were like a, they were like a bus coming through the air. And it, when they hit the ground, there was a big ball of flame and everything got incinerated. And they also had these big, enormous blockbusters come down. And they'd not a complete row of buildings down. So when the uh, the second raid was... The first raid was sort of a... It was just a taster to what they was going to deliver in the second raid. So And everything burnt then. Everything was caught alight on the second raid. It, uh, there was just nowhere to go. Anybody was in the open. All you could do was to lay down, and the ground was hot. Everything was... I've, I've, after the second raid had finished, everything was alight. All the tar in the roads were, was bubbling. And I'm talking about the centre of Dresden, I'm not talking about the outskirts. Uh, and all the people, of course, were buried in their... in their... Uh, in their... Luftschutzkeller, their uh, underground yep. shelters underneath their houses. They couldn't get out. And they, they were the things they thought would keep them safe. But they must have just got... Hotter and well, hotter. that's where they went. Where they went once the uh, air, once the they, they realised they was going to get bombed, they went down into the cellars. Unfortunately, yeah, quite a lot of them survived the first raid, and uh, you could, because you could see them coming out uh, after the first raid finished, crawling out amongst the rubble. Some of them, those that had survived, and then of course when the second raid started, they went back in again. The second raid flattened everything. There was nothing standing after that. So they were well and truly trapped. So they all got roasted and burnt alive. Thousands of them, thousands of them. 25,000 is ridiculous. There was 5,000 in one shelter alone. The trouble was that you couldn't count them because in the big shelters, which were near in the Ulstead, the big shelters, when you finally got the door open, there wasn't any bodies. There was a lot of bones, a lot of bones and stuff like that, but there was no flesh. It was all melted. It's on the floor. 
still and you babbling. Say, you say that, I know you say that because you did that. They actually yeah, put yeah, to work, yeah, didn't they? I can only speak as I find, you know. Uh, I've got, I've, I haven't got a lot of time for people who, who come up with these figures because uh, I, I think myself there's a certain amount of whitewashing going on. And I've got no axe to grind. I'm, I, I'm not... I've got no extra grind whatsoever except to tell people that uh, how disgusting it all is. And, and Just how to we say, should, uh, that, I mean, that figure of 25,000, I mean, AJP Taylor used that figure of 25,000, and then there was a commission, yeah, but a German commission. Even AJP Taylor, I would put him down as a sort of a... Uh, I, I think if somebody like, well, uh, like, uh, well, Ellis or somebody like that wrote about it, that you might get a different idea. I don't know. I, who am I to say? All I can say is that uh, there was dead bodies everywhere. Well, what you could call dead bodies, they were all... You just yeah. couldn't... Because when we went to get these bodies out, uh, you couldn't put, bring a body out because it would break up. It, the, heat, the heat in these ovens was terrific. And they just melted the bodies. You can only hope, can't you, that most of these people died of smoke inhalation or they, 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 that's they what lost consciousness. That's what I said. If if you started if you started dwelling on it on that, on the agony they must have suffered, then you would it it's reason reasonable to presume that you would go completely stark bonkers. You, you just wouldn't um, the mind of people wouldn't be able to cope if you was to think in the, thinking of the horrors. That these people must have gone, and they were all women and children and old people, not a soldier amongst them. Uh, Tell us about the man that that you oh, the went to, the general. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I called him the general. Yeah, Good. our general. Good. Yeah, he loved it. Uh, and he, 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 uh, I was the only Englishman in the group, and so he called me Tommy. Hello, uh, hello, Tommy. Tommy used to call me Tommy, and. Uh, 